Thank you, choir, for that nice piece of music. Sorry for you, children of God, uh, who, because of the language barrier, have not been able to understand the riches, the richness, and the value of the song that the choir has just sung. But they have sung about the mercy of God. Is it mercy, Rehema? The grace of God that is sufficient and that has made our forgiveness possible. Thank you, choir. I am considering joining the choir. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you indeed. Asante sana. Praise God. God is good. And all the time. Happy New Year. We praise God for the grace and the blessings of our new year. Uh, we thank him for how he has brought us to this new year. I personally just found myself this side of the year. I did not cross. I was brought. And I am grateful that the Lord brought me. I believe that you also did not cross. You were brought this side of the year, isn't it? We just found ourselves this side of the year by his help. And we owe him all our gratitude. We praise him for his care, protection, and provision. And for the blessings that he has for us this year. This is despite uh, how it has started for some of us. And especially as it's been highlighted by Dr. Wangai about the students, the Nairobi University Students Adventist Group who had gone to an area that is very close to where I come from uh, in Budalangi for mission. And after they had completed the mission, we lost three of them because they were taking a boat ride. We pray for God's comfort upon the family and upon the Nairobi University Adventist Group and also to the Nairobi University Fraternity, the Lord's comfort be upon you. Friends, it is to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you where you where as you enter you will find a cold tide and on which no man has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you why you are losing it, thus you shall say it to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were losing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you losing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus and they threw their clothes on the colt and they sat Jesus on him and as he went many spread their clothes on the road then as he was now drawing near the descent of the mount of olives the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise god with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen saying blessed is the king who comes in the name of the lord Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if this should keep silent, the stones will cry, will cry out. Our sermon title today is The Stones Will Cry Out. 
Shall we pray? Loving Father, we thank you for this beautiful moment, the opportunity to hear from your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit brings us to the riches of this portion of the scripture. May it bring redemption. May it bring restoration in each one and every one of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. In July 2008. Where were you in July 2008? A global business executive by the name Hata von Stiegel, I may not have pronounced her name well, led a group of 28 multinational climbers to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro for charity. Against incredible odds, 60% of the group made it to the summit. This was a remarkable feat, considering that typically only 35% of climbers achieve that goal. Friends, today, as we think about this lady and the group who are intentional on climbing Mount Kilimanjaro and who, despite the incredible difficulties that anyone has to face when he is climbing such a massive mountain, they made it to the summit. It is my pleasure to let all of us know that as these people seem to have been focused to have achieved their coming to the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro and were able to overcome all the challenges, there is one who loves us and whose commitment for our salvation could not be stopped in any way. Our Savior was committed to our salvation and nothing was going to stop him. Welcome with me to the book of Luke chapter 19. Luke is a wonderful reading for any one of us. Of the many gospel writers, Luke is one of the very nice pieces. Notwithstanding how beautiful and nice the others are, Luke came to write his portion later after having done sufficient research. And chapter 19 that we consider this morning is full of wonderful occasions and wonderful lessons for all of us. But for our consideration today, as we come to our Holy Communion, we will consider the portion, verse 28 to verse 40. The Bible says, when he had said thus, he went on ahead, climbing or ascending to Jerusalem. Allow me to observe that that statement is very loaded. I read so much of this portion of the scripture. I don't have the time to be able to tell you everything. But this is what I saw as I was spending time in this portion of the scripture. Look. Let's us know at this point that he was ascending to Jerusalem. Uh, reading this text from the context of the entire history of Jesus Christ. You will be happy to know that as Jesus started his ministry, 
he was actually very reluctant to come to Jerusalem. In the book of John chapter 3, chapter 7 verse 3, it was during the feast of the Passover. And at this time, every Jew, every Israelite, every Hebrew will gather in Jerusalem. And Jesus had already begun to show that he was the Messiah. And his brethren and his mother decided that he will now come to Jerusalem and make himself known in a public place where public people are, the real public place in Israel. Whoever wanted to be known as somebody, this is the place that he needed to be identified and be seen, not in Nazareth. But Jesus told them, uh, he was reluctant in a nutshell to go. He told them, I'm not coming. In fact, he said, I'm not coming. But later on, he went. He was, started his ministry slowly in a soul way and with very little interaction with the Jerusalem. But this Jerusalem will be an important place because it is declared so in the scripture. And as you come by the book of Luke chapter 9 and verse 51, reading Luke, just relax and follow. I'm really not in a hurry, but I have a message for the world, for all of us. Luke chapter 9 and verse 51. words in hearing them properly. Now it says when the time had come. Not any other time but his time that he knew he needed to do what he needed to do. When the time had come to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up uh, he steadfastly without delay set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he starts in Jerusalem, starts on his way to Jerusalem in Luke chapter 9. And it is now in Luke chapter 19 that we're finding him entering into Jerusalem. He had started with intention, deliberately, now to be received. The other time, the parents and the brethren were giving a push on him. And he was reluctant to come. But this time, he is now intentional and he now is coming. No wonder Luke chapter 19 verse 18, 28 starts by saying that when he had said thus, he went on ahead going. That Jesus, up until this time, he had been not very quick to have his work publicized. He had healed somebody who had come to him, a leper. In the book of Luke chapter 5 verse 14. Luke chapter 5 and verse 14. A leper came to him and talk, told him if...
Jesus in the book, this same book of Luke chapter 8 and verse 54. The Bible says, as he was in Jericho. This is on. He is on his mission and he has been invited by Jairus to go and heal his daughter. But on his way, there is a woman who happens to, to touch him and power is withdrawn from him and he feels this and he talks about it. Finally, he comes to Jairus' place and Jairus' daughter is dead and he directs Jairus' daughter. Up until this time, Jesus still wants to remain incognito and does not want his ministry to be published. But as we come to Mark, Luke chapter 19 verse 28, the Bible tells us that when he had said, Luke chapter 9 verse 51 that we read that when his time had come then uh, he intentionally started on his way to Jerusalem he cannot be delayed probably just to let you know that what is this that he had said his disciples had been asking about bringing the kingdom and he told them a parable and told them that uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who went in a far country to bring his kingdom. In other words, he was telling the disciples that, yes, I have come to bring a kingdom, but it is going to take a little while before that kingdom come. And when he had said thus, now he starts on his way to go to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he... from River Jordan, climbing up. Of course, he had come to Jericho. This is where he had healed Bartimaeus, and he had made Zacchaeus, and he continued on, now coming to Jerusalem. And as he came to Bethphage and Bethany, uh, two villages which were adjacent to each other on the eastern side of Mount Olive. Those of you who had the privilege to go to Israel now can be able to get the picture that these two villages are on the eastern side of uh, Mount Olives and, uh, and uh, Jerusalem is on the western side. So from Bethany and Bethphage, you climb Mount Olives to the west to come to Jerusalem or you will go southwards and come to Jerusalem. If you didn't want to climb, then you went had a longer route that was not climbing, that was not hilly, to go to Jerusalem. So the Bible tells us that as he came to Bethphage, he tells the disciples, go into the village that is over against you, and you will find, in the endering of which you will find a colt, untie it and bring it. What is Jesus up to? He has wanted all this time to be private. And that privacy, he would like to bring it to an end. He's now very intentional. He tells them, you'll find a cult. And Matthew telling this same story in Matthew chapter 21 will tell you that it was as it was written. This, what Jesus is doing, asking the disciples to go to the village that was over against them, Bethany and Bethphage, was as it was written that he who will come as the king will ride on a colt, a fall of a donkey, in the book of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Will you please go there with me? Zechariah, Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 9 and verse number 9. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse number 9. The Bible says, 
Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, a fall of a donkey. Jesus is asking the disciples, get into the village that is over against them, Bethany, and get a cold. And they went and he told them, if anyone asks you why you are losing the donkey or the cold of a donkey, tell him the master has need of it. And they that were sent went and found it exactly as he had told them. And as they were losing the colt, the owners asked them, why are you losing the colt? And his, they said, the, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to him, laid their cloth on it, and put Jesus on it. Something was happening. Allow me to observe, friends, that you might not know, but Jesus had advanced schedule. It was very clear in his mind where to start and where to stop. When it was time, he knew it was time. No wonder Luke, who follows this story of Jesus, will come and write it later for us. And begin to let us know that before time was, he was cool. And he had to take his ministry as he will take it and build it slowly building the momentum and when the right time had come started by building the disciples having disciples around him by calling them one by one and interacting with them it is now has been three years and a half he's interacted with them enough and he is ready now to come to the work to do the work that brought him on the planet earth Luke tells us in chapter 9, verse 51, when the time had come, now he headed towards Jerusalem. And as he coming to Jerusalem, the Bible tells us, he tells his disciples, go to the village of against you and get a colt over on which no man has sat and loose him, bring him here. Jesus understood the scripture. Jesus understood his assignment and how it had been stipulated in the scripture. And he went step by step. Please allow me to bring you very quickly to some of those scriptures in the Bible that talks about Jesus and how they were revealed exactly as they, uh, how they turned out to be exactly as it had been prophesied in the Old Testament. In the book of Matthew chapter 1 and verse 22, the Bible records of the virgin birth that Jesus was to be born of a virgin and this was in accordance with the words of the prophet and this was prophet Isaiah who in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 will say so Isaiah will you please go with me to Isaiah 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 chapter 7 and verse 14, Isaiah 7, Isaiah 7, chapter 7, and we are reading what verse? Verse 14, this is an account about how it had been laid out in the Old Testament and it's Happening in the New Testament. Chapter 7 verse 14. The Bible says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And shall call his name Emmanuel. Is this not what you find when Matthew is reporting in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 22. You will go there at your free time. Now we will read a New Testament text and look for its, how it was spoken in the, in the Old Testament. The Bible about Jesus Christ says that he was to be born in a particular place. 
In the book of Matthew chapter 2 and verse 5. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 5. Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 5. The Bible says, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 5. The Bible says, so they said to him in Bethlehem of Judah, for thus is written by the prophet. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you, are, you shall come a ruler who will spread my, who will shepherd my people Israel. And this is as it is in accordance with the, the prophecy of the servant of the Lord, Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Matthew was 2 verse 5. But Micah is 5 verse 2. Just interchangeably. Matthew 2 5. Micah 5 2. Micah is the one who had prophesied that Jesus would be born where? In Bethlehem. Uh, you can follow many other occasions about Jesus' prophecy. It says that he will grow in Nazareth. And Matthew says the same in Matthew chapter 2 verse 23. Matthew where we have been. Chapter 2, the same chapter, but verse number 23. And he came to dwell in the city called Nazareth. That is, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. He shall be called a Nazarene. This is when Jesus was coming from Egypt, where he had taken asylum with the parents. And when they heard that Herod was still reigning, uh, Herod had already died, but for fear of whatever will happen in Jerusalem, they went to Nazareth, and so he grows up in Nazareth. And Matthew tells us, as it had been written, by which prophet was this? This was Amos chapter 2. Amos chapter 2 and verse 10 to 11 is that tells us that Jesus will grow up in Nazareth. Now, Jesus, without tiring you with several texts, there are many in the scripture that you can be able to refer to how the life of Jesus Christ was already marked out in the Old Testament. In other words, there was a divine schedule on which Jesus was operating. And when that divine schedule came to the time for him to be revealed in Jerusalem, he comes and he does one of those things that had been prophesied in the Old Testament in the book of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Jesus knew the word of the Lord. He lived it to the details. There are many people who have, who still have problems appreciating the word of God. They have no time for it. But those of you who take time to read and as you follow explanations like this one, you realize that the word of God is reliable. But yet there are those who love the word of God, but they like to pick it selectively. They pick the things they want and they leave out the things that are rubbishing them in the wrong way. So we pick the Bible selectively. Allow me to submit to all of us that as followers of Jesus Christ, and this is to the entire Christian dome, that if we will be honest with ourselves, we cannot afford to be playing games with the word of God. We pick a portion and we leave out some other portions as it will be. We are Adventists. I don't want to brag in any way, but I am grateful that I'm an Adventist. And this is the church that would like to follow the word of God as it is. When the word of God says Sabbath, it is Sabbath. It remains to be Sabbath and we rest on Sabbath. Others will tell you, well, a day does not matter. And then you wonder whether the word of God they follow is the same one that we follow. Or are they selective in their appreciation of the word of God? They appreciate certain portions of the scriptures and leave out other portions. Jesus will have us know that the word of God is true and we will will need to leave it as it is. And Jesus lived it to the letter. He lived it to the letter. 
It is a call, Jesus, the way Jesus lives the word of God, the way he lived it. It's a call upon us to take it in its fullness and submit its authority without questions and uh, without surmising and excuses. It says it, pick it the way it is. Praise the name of the Lord. Jesus loved the word of God. We have to love the word of God and take it as it is and submit to its authority. And so he tells the disciples, go into the village that is over against you. Get a cold. You will find a cold in the entering of it. Tied. Untied, lose him and bring it here. They go and find it exactly as it was and then bring it to Jesus and as they bring it to Jesus, something begins to happen. Some very interesting action begins to take place. They do not only bring it to him as he had requested, but they seem to have perceived something. They put their cloth on it and they take Jesus and put him on it. These disciples seem to have been following with the scripture. And they know what the scripture had already said is now coming to pass. What Zechariah had said in Zechariah 9.9 is going to pass. That our Messiah finally is revealed. And they are happy to, to be incorporated in proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. Disciples of Jesus Christ put their clothes on them, on the cold, put him on it. And the Bible says, as they came to the place above Mount Olives, in the, where you begin to descend down. That is, at the very top, just as the descent begins on Mount Olives. You are together with me. We came from the east, isn't it? East is this way. We came from the east, from Jericho, from Jordan, Jericho, Bethany, Bethphage. We, we climb Mount Olives and we are on the top of Mount Olives. And uh, they joyfully, the Bible says, the whole crowd, the whole disciples who saw this happening joyfully began to praise God and says, and they said these words, which are the words they say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They have already perceived that their Messiah is here. And they begin to praise the name of the Lord. Those who have taken, allow me probably just to take some time to share the fact that it had been time. It had been time before it happens this way. Jesus had been building his ministry, his momentum from a low level. Now it's coming to the peak of it. Previously, he will not allow this thing to happen. But now he is allowing it. In fact, he will even defend it. He had started by calling them from wherever they were. Peter and his brother Andrew from being fishermen. John, the son of Zebedee and his brother uh, James. He called them and Matthew called from tax collection, collection and he called all of them, made some of them to be his disciples. Of course, there were those who were his followers, but out of these many followers, he picked 12 of them to be very close to him, to be the ones that he will teach. And he teaches them three years and a half. I know there are many of us who would like things to be done very quickly. It takes time. To teach. Uh, the universities these days bring the one to have students coming to the university and come and live quickly. Uh, but learning takes time. Those of you who have been in school agree that learning takes time because we come with packages. We, are, we even don't want to study and we have to settle in and uh, then we begin to learn slowly and seems Jesus understood this and he takes his time slowly. But what I would like to bring to attention is the fact that by the time now it's coming to this time, Jesus is intentionally coming to Jerusalem. He also knows that his disciples 
are rife. And he incorporates them in making him known as the Messiah. No wonder he tells the Bible is intentional when he says he told his disciples to go into the village that was over against them. He asked the disciples to be part and parcel of that work. And when they come, they seem to have perceived what was happening and they quickly respond to it. And they lay their clothes on the, on the colt and they lay their clothes also on the road. Matthew will tell us those who didn't have clothes probably to lay uh, plucked branches of tree or the branches of the tree which they had already plucked elsewhere. They laid it on the road and they began to shout with a loud voice. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Disciples, people who take time to follow with Jesus Christ can't help it but fall in love with him and become his witnesses. And we see these disciples becoming, starting the work of his, their witness about Jesus right now. Of course, a few times he had asked them to go out. And in those times, he had given them several instructions. This time, he asked them to go and do something and uh, there will be sufficient rejection and opposition and hatred coming from the religious group of the society. But he will teach the disciples how to meet this kind of opposition. The disciples who have followed with Jesus Christ will be able to know when it is time. They knew it is time to make it known. And they did not waste time. They began to publish their savior. They say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory on the earth. I must observe at this time, however, because I know you know that a portion of this crowd will be the same one who will be on this same week on Friday. This is Sunday, which is called Palm Sunday. A portion of this group Will be, not all of them, but a portion of them will be the ones saying crucify him. But this time, they got it that the Messiah is here. And with this understanding, therefore, allow me to observe, it is their understanding of the Messiah weird as it was. Because the understanding of Messiah was a, a, a political deliverer, a political emancipator, who was going to set them free from the Roman dominion and governance. They were happy that finally the Messiah is here to deliver them from the bondage of the Romans. And they had every reason, therefore, to say praise. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven because they knew there is no peace in heaven as long as Israel was still under the dominion of the Romans. And when peace in heaven is in heaven, there will also be glory in heaven. So whereas there is also that backdrop of reality that yes, this was their understanding of who a Messiah was. Jesus did not have to have an issue with it. They will come to know with time. After all, he has been telling them all this while that he is not the kind of Messiah they are looking for. He is not the political deliverer that they are looking for all this while. But he is a spiritual savior. Whereas it might not be clear to all of them but this time. It will be clear with them subsequently. Because even after resurrection in, in the book of written by this same Luke in, in the book of Acts, they will still be asking him, are you now going to, to establish the kingdom? And he will tell them that it is the father who will determine the time. Yours is to be witnesses. Using that word, yours is to be witnesses, Jesus allows 
the disciples at this moment to continue witnessing with the information they still are struggling with of the Messiah. However, they appreciate the fact that he is the Messiah. And not only are they saying he's the Messiah and therefore the king, he is, they are also saying that he is the savior. He is the savior. By laying their, their clothes on the donkey, on the colt, and by laying their clothes on the road as Jesus rode, they are not only saying that you are the king, but we also submit to your kingship. We also submit to your messianship. We surrender. Hallelujah. Yes. When you have been a careful student of the word of the Lord, when you see something happening, you will know that God is moving. And it is time to be able to act. And these disciples seem to have understood this from the writing of the Old Testament. That the time for the Messiah who was said by Zechariah has come and it's our time to be able to sing. They could not restrain themselves. Ellen G. Ward says that among this group that will be singing this particular day includes those who had been dumb, but uh, whom Jesus had been heal had healed and they were the ones shouting at the top of their voice. Hallelujah. And among those who are laying their clothes were those ones who were lepers and therefore regarded as unclean, but now had been healed by Jesus Christ and their clothes were now clean and they could be used as a carpet for Jesus Christ. And they were the ones who were very quickly to lay their clothes down because they were now clean, hallelujah. And those who had been uh, lame were the ones jumping the highest because they had been Restored, for the Bible says, because of the work they had done, they were rejoicing. The Messiah had come. Praise the name of the Lord. But whereas this was happening, there is the Pharisees there as a contrast. As a contrast to the response of the disciples is the response of the Pharisees who say, Master, rebuke. In fact, it is an imperative. The, the Greek word there is an imperative. It's a command to Jesus Christ. Rebuke your disciples. They are a nuisance. They are causing trouble. They are going to cause trouble for us. You see, when they begin to sing this way and make you to seem to be the king, you are bringing trouble for us. Don't you know that we are under the, the Roman dominion? And now you are standing up and you are allowing these people to be able to sing you as the king. We will be in trouble. Rebuke them. Rebuke them. Certain scholars say, no, this seems to have been a friendly advice. Because certain portions of the scripture, these Pharisees had been seen to be a little friendly. They had even invited Jesus to dine in their place and to eat with them. But if you look critically at the invitation of the Pharisees and the discussions that will go on in those invitations, it will tell you that this friendship did not last. It, didn't, it wasn't there in a real sense. In the first place, they invited Jesus for the reason of finding something to accuse him about. And when they invited him, many of the time, the relationship, Jesus was rebuking them in some of those cases. A case in point is Simon the leper, uh, who had been considered to have been a Pharisee. Uh, when he invited Jesus Christ, he had issues with Jesus Christ. And Jesus responds in a manner to rebuke him, to tell him, uh, this woman has been forgiven more. Uh, Looking at all the invitations and the discussion, the unfriendly discussion that happens in those invitations, it becomes difficult to think that this was a friendly advice. Up until this time, it's been going badly between Jesus and the Pharisees, the religious leaders. And so this was not a friendly advice I will submit. Uh, especially looking also at the fact that they, what they use is a command. It's an imperative. 
is not a friendly adverse. Otherwise, they are simply saying, yes, we notice that people are recognizing you as the Messiah, the King, and the Savior. But we don't. You are not the kind of the Messiah we are looking for. You are not the kind of the king we are looking for. We are looking for a political king. Your background does not offer that where you have come from. And the way we have listened to you and the way you've explained yourself that your kingdom is not of this world, you are not the kind of Messiah we are looking for. Allow me to observe that whereas others were accepting Jesus Christ, though their perception was weird in a way of the Messiah, they had in it in their perception, they had in their belief that he was also the savior of the world. And they demonstrate their belief by what they do, by putting their clothes on the cold and putting their clothes on the road. A sign of submission and surrender to him. So whereas others were accepting Jesus as the Messiah, there were others who are in, who are in contrast rejecting the Messiah. Friends, there are two people in the world who will accept Jesus as the Messiah and there are those, there are those ones who will reject him for their reasons. Probably because he does not fit the kind of the Messiah that you see, the kind of savior that you look for. He does not make sense for them. And so they have rejected the whole idea of Jesus Christ. And no wonder the world is divided in two. There are those who are believers and there are those ones who are not believers. The choice is ours to choose. The first ones responded in joy and accepted Jesus Christ. The Pharisees will have nothing to do with Jesus. If anything, they tell him, rebuke your disciples. We don't acknowledge you as the king. We don't acknowledge you as the savior. They took their position. But the disciples took their position. And Jesus told the Pharisees, if they don't, the stones will cry out. Disciples of Jesus Christ are always in the business of publishing who Jesus is. And the disciples in the case that we look at in Luke chapter 19 verse 28 to 40 were joyful in publishing Jesus for who he was. Despite their limited information. And Jesus will defend the action and say, if they kept quiet, God will find a way for this to happen. For his coming to die had come. And it was unstoppable. And he's presenting himself as the savior of the world this week in Jerusalem. The week of the Passover was unstoppable. It had to happen. He was committed to it. Even if it was going to mean death, he was willing, he was ready to take it. Jesus shows intentionality and he says he was ready to die and his disciples were okay to publish him as the savior and if they stopped, God will find a way to publish him as the savior of the world. There are many times as followers of Jesus Christ and his disciples we are not sure whether we should go and make Jesus known to the world that we interact with. Allow me to let you know, if you don't, the stones will cry. If as New Life Church, we stop doing mission, mission will not stop. In other places, it will do what? It will still continue. I hear Jesus saying that the invitation to do mission is an imperative. The call for us to make Jesus known to the world is unstoppable. You need just to join and be part and parcel of it. When the disciples understood their Savior and the Messiah, 
they were all out for it and they published it. And as they did, so we are to do. We demonstrate our belief in Jesus Christ by making our resources available. Those disciples make their clothes available to clothe, to put uh, a cuddle on the back of the colt for Jesus to sit on and spread on the road. And uh, we do that when we give our resources in the building of the church. You know, the laying of the cabro. That is, those are your clothes that you put there as a demonstration of your belief in Jesus Christ. When we go out on mission to do the work of God, to build the school in Sekeri, we are uh, putting our clothes there for Jesus to walk on them as our demonstration of belief in Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world and our submission to his Lordship. When we go to do mission in Esonorua, Kamkuru, and 46, we are by our resources or even in presence, we are demonstrating that we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. We have been doing it, and this year we need to continue doing it. Praise the name of the Lord. And now this year, we will not just do it. We have learned from this portion of the scripture that Jesus operated on a divine schedule. Elder Saboke is our stewardship, is, is our strategic planning leader for this year, 2023. He will be working together with all of us to make sure that he give us a schedule for the many things that we would like to execute. And all of us agree on them and begin to live one by one, executing them. Without competing, and uh, without contention and uh, without looking back. Now we know that the disciples of Jesus are happy publishing him as their savior. These disciples published Jesus. It is our turn now to publish him. And uh, Elder will give us our schedule after we have submitted our plans and, uh, and uh, uh, we have voted them in the board and uh, in the business meeting and we will return every end of the quarter to see how we are faring as far as that schedule is concerned. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm personally excited about what we are about to do this year as we get organized in a good way. And uh, as all of us are reading from the same script and doing the work of disciples and not letting it to the stones to do it, but we being the ones doing it ourselves. The Lord bless you and keep you. The disciples accepted Jesus as the King and the Messiah. Today is Holy Communion. It is for those who have accepted Jesus Christ as the Savior, the Messiah, the King of Kings. The choice is still ours either to accept him or not. The disciples did, the Pharisees rejected. Let me see by show of hand those of you who, like the disciples, are excited. They know what the Bible has already revealed. That in Jesus, taking it on to ride on a cold, he declared himself as the Messiah of the world, the Savior of the world. They accepted him as their, the Messiah and the Savior by the laying down of their clothes in submission of his lordship. Whereas the, the, the Pharisees were in objection. And you're here and you're saying, yes, that savior who rode on a donkey, a fall, on a cold, he is my savior. He, I submit to him. I submit to his lordship. And I come to the table as a demonstration of my faith in him. The choice is ours. Who says together with me, that savior who rode on a colt and who said that if the stones, if the disciples don't publish this news, this reality, my being the Messiah, the King and the savior, the stones will, I am one like those disciples who published and I want to publish it today and I will publish it always as long as I will live. And as long as we still wait for the second coming of Jesus Christ, is this your savior also? He is my savior. If he is your savior, let me see you by a show of hand. 
Shall we rise for word of prayer? Loving Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and praise your name. We are so grateful that as far as our salvation is concerned, you are so committed to it that nothing was to stop you. No wonder you intentionally, when the right time came, you came to Jerusalem and made yourself known to the entire world that you are the one who had been prophesied in the Old Testament by Zechariah and the other prophets as the Savior, the Messiah, and the King. When the disciples at that time perceived the coming to fulfillment of the Old Testament, they did not hold their peace. They shouted with joy and said, Praise be to God, to him who comes in the name of the Lord. They demonstrated their belief in you as the Messiah, the King, and as the Savior. We are standing on our feet to join those disciples to accept you as the King, the Messiah, and our Savior. We are well aware that it's not everybody that accepts you this way. But we stand to be counted among those who, who believe in you as the Savior, the Messiah, and the King. We accept you, Lord Jesus, as our Lord. Have your way in our lives. We thank you, dear Lord, for operating in the word and you have demonstrated us that, to us that your word is true and reliable. You followed it. You lived it. Help us also to live as per what your word has said and not look for excuses in situations where it is speaking against what we have here before perceived and lived in. Help us, Lord, not to struggle with your word, but to live it as it is. May this be our experience, for we pray and trust in Jesus' name. 